Welcome to FASKIN's 2022 mining series. This is our 12th consecutive series. I am Virginia Schweitzer and I'm part of the FASKIN Global Mining Group. It's such a pleasure to be here today. We are at the end of our first week. This is our ninth of 15 sessions, which continue until Wednesday of next week. Please refer to the slide on your screen for some housekeeping items following the presentation. Now I will turn it over to my colleague, Jeff Dennis, the moderator for International Deal Gateway. And Jeff will introduce the panel. Thanks very much. Over to you, Jeff. Thanks, Virginia. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to our session. This one's a little bit different. Most of the sessions you might have attended were legalistic and certainly educational. This one is a is a showcase of different mining companies from different minerals and different geographies. And, and, and we even have a tech company. So um, we hope you enjoy it. My name is Jeff Dennis. I'm a counsel here at Faskin. And before that, I was a serial entrepreneur and best-selling author and public speaker. Um, I'm a, a member of uh, International Deal Gateway. Um, in fact, I've been a member since their, their inception. And uh, it's really a terrific environment. Uh, so I, I would call myself a raving fan. So you should definitely check it out. But I'd like to pass uh, the virtual mic over to our moderator this afternoon, Steve Davidson. Steve is the vice president of sales and partnership at uh, International Deal Gateway, and he'll tell you more about it. Uh, he has been helping companies connect with investors for the past decade, first at Cambridge House and more re recently with proactive investors. He joined International Deep Deal Gateway in 2021 as VP of Sales. Take it away, Steve. Jeff, thank you for the opportunity to host this panel today. And thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, as Jeff mentioned, I am Steve Davidson, uh, Vice President of Sales and Partnerships here at International Deal Gateway. Um, we're a private global network of founders, CEOs, investors, and family offices. We've recently hit 10,000 members all over the world. Our members are focused on connecting through our digital portal, sharing investment opportunities, mergers and acquisitions, and other investments not available through traditional channels. In addition to the online platform, we also host a number of family office investor events all over the world. If you'd like to learn more, please visit dealgateway.com. Uh, now onto our session today. Uh, we have six presenting companies. Each presenter will provide a 10 minute overview of their organization, followed by one to two questions from our audience. We encourage audience interaction. So please post your questions in the chat box and I will read some at the conclusion of that company's presentation. I'd like to start us off with a non-traditional resource company, MineHub Technologies. This company is modernizing the mining and metal supply chain with their revolutionary platform. Please welcome our new star Boosman from MineHub Technologies. Take it away. Thanks, Steve. Um, I'm Aaron Starbusman, CEO at Mylab Technologies, and uh, thanks for the opportunity to present here today. Um, starting out, I would like to play a movie first because it gives a very good high-level intro in terms of what Mylab does and where we play, and then I'll drill, drill down into some of the more detailed aspects of that. Cassie, do you want to play the movie? Metals and mining powers the world economy. In fact, $1.8 trillion worth of metals and minerals move across the planet every year, feeding industry with much needed raw materials to manufacture the products we use every day. The metals and mining supply chain is long. It involves hundreds of companies, thousands of people, and millions of interactions. The whole journey of moving raw materials from the mine over land, in trucks and trains, through the ports and across the oceans to the smelter and beyond is weighed down by manual processes, back and forth interactions and red tape, which are time consuming and costly. For example, moving one container from Africa to the Netherlands involves more than 30 organisations, 200 interactions, 100 people and a timeline of 34 days. 30% of this time and effort is wasted on simply processing documents. On a global scale, over $150 billion is lost on multi-party and paper-based processes every year. 
But all of that is changing. Right here, right now. With Minehub, a digital platform for the metals and mining industry with a rapid deployment model for speed and scalability. By implementing an operating system for the 21st century, we take all the complexity and streamline it into simple, immediate digital interactions powered by blockchain technology. Which means you act on real-time data today. Instead of being busy reconciling yesterday's documents, the MineHub platform allows for far greater collaboration between all parties. Miners, traders, processors, financiers, carriers, inspectors, and ports in real time and digitally. We help the metals and mining industry across the whole supply chain go paperless. And by doing so, help companies operate faster, cut costs, and delight customers with seamless service. MineHub will transform the metals and mining industry using blockchain technology. With security and privacy, it will allow companies to optimize working capital, improve access to finance, and gain transparency across their global supply chain. So goodbye fraud, hello trust. In today's world, where ESG is at the forefront of society, we can help companies to achieve compliance with solutions, such as by tracking their carbon emissions, or verifying mineral provenance across their supply chain. MineHub has established itself by partnering with some of the biggest players in the industry. Companies who are committed to our mission of creating a digitized supply chain. MineHub will have a pivotal role in that digital transformation towards an integrated supply chain in control of its own future. It's estimated that digital transformation will generate $320 billion of value in the metal and mining industry over the next decade, including $77 billion through an integrated ecosystem, exchanging data throughout the world. And although the MineHub platform has a focus on metals and mining currently, it is a technology that has the potential to expand into other areas too. Our platform addresses some of the key challenges that can be found in other commodity supply chains and industries. MineHub is a global operation. We have offices around the world, managed by a world-class team. The future is MineHub. The future is bright. MineHub, the transformation starts right here, right now. Visit our website now www.minehub.com Thank you uh, for watching that. So um, just briefly recapping, uh, MineUp is a digital blockchain-based platform. It's for natural resources and industrial supply chains with an uh, initial focus on mining and metals. So we use blockchain technology to enable our users to have complete control over the privacy, security, and location of their data. They don't have to hand over custody of the valuable data assets to a third-party platform operator. Now, at the same time, they can rely on the integrity of the data that's being shared by their business partner with them based on the immutability features of the blockchain. So MindUp is also building a, an industry network, digitally connecting producers, traders, processors, financiers, et cetera, pr providing them with applications that help to address big challenges like ESG compliance, carbon emissions accounting, supply chain resilience, assay exchange, and improving access to capital, for instance. But let's drill down on some of these aspects. So uh, and take, let's take ESG. It's a critical part of doing business now, and it will only get more so. But some ESG-related problems are hard or almost impossible to solve without access to data that is effectively created, maintained, and owned by others. For instance, scope three, emissions accounting. And reporting is an imperative now that requires companies to account for the emissions of their suppliers and their customers. So if you've got hundreds of customers, you've got thousands of suppliers, each with many different products, with each of them with changing emissions content, taking different routes as they're being shipped from them to you or to your customers. How do you, how do you capture all those data, part, data points? How do you track them? How do you report on that? This is exactly what MineUp does. We enable companies to track and report on their scope three emissions at a transaction, a product, customer, and supplier level, automated in real time. 
And another one is, for instance, supply chain disruptions. They're left, right, and center on the news now, and even more so since the pandemic started. And the current situation in, in Europe is a, is a prime example of the impact it will have on supply chain. So, and then the Economist report from a few months ago, it was highlighted that on average, companies lose 42% of their EBDA due to single shock supply chain disruptions. That's almost half the annual income wiped out. Executives are even more worried about the lasting impact of these disruptions in the form of damage to brand reputation and their customer confidence. They realize that they need te technology to really improve the resilience and visibility into their supply chains, and for which blockchain is recognized as a critical enabling technology. And there are other valuable problems we're already solving and others we are working on. So, for instance, uh, we will connect carbon markets to transactions that we run on MineUp. Together with our real-time emissions accounting that I just explained, will enable companies to purchase carbon credits in real time, offset the emissions of their transactions and shipments at source also in real time. And there's the application, for instance, that we're building to connect royalty and streaming contracts to the underlying transactions and shipments, providing real-time visibility on realized sales, taking out messy reconciliation, freeing up working capital for both the producer as well as the um, uh, streamer. MindUp is commodity agnostic, not limited to specific verticals. We've proven the solution already in iron ore and concentrates and are now piloting in refined metals. The problems we work on, they're very real and our solutions are not made up. They've been validated, developed, tested in close collaboration with our users from the day we started in 2018. And these users include both giants of industry as well as SME. So uh, to drop some names, BHP is working with us, Sumitomo Corporation, Vale, Roy Hill, China Min Metals, China Baowu, ING, Kumor Capital, and so on. And there are many more. Uh, that are um, that we're working with and will be disclosed in the in the future. MindUp is provided as a SaaS solution to customers. It's cloud-based. Onboarding time is short. We can uh, install and, and and train on the same day, anywhere in the world, even in mainland China, to support the regulatory compliance there. We charge a monthly subscription fee per individual user for the basic services, which help to capture the key transaction data. Our applications that add value to the underlying transaction data sets. We have more uh, usage and value-based pricing models. So for instance, for trade finance, we'll charge financiers like a couple of basis points per month of the exposure that they administer on MineUp. The platform is in production. It's in rollout mode in a wide open blue ocean. We've got an incredible team as well to support that rollout and presence in key markets like China, Japan, and Singapore. There's an impressive lineup of customers that are either moving to production now or have started their journey with us. Most of these come through existing customers because supply chains are fundamentally a network. And any digital platform that is successful in connecting these supply chains can therefore benefit from very powerful network effects with exponential value creation for both users and the platform company. And for that though, first mover advantage is very important to capture that critical mass first. And we are well positioned to do just that. Our customers and prospects, they tell us that MindUp is the most advanced platform of its kind with the most comprehensive offering and presence, and not least because we're already working with the largest brands in the industry. Uh, so I guess to rephrase in mining parlance, we've, we've done our exploration, we've proven reserves, we've completed our construction, set up operations, secured offtake, and we started production in a market which will have uh, exponentially growing demand with very limited supply. So we're listed on the TSX Ventures Exchange, Ticker symbol MHUB. Thank you. Any questions? Uh, Arnu, thank you very much for that. I do have a question here from the audience. Um, are you just focused on metals and mining, or are you also looking at other markets? No, no, it's we already started to tap into other markets. Mining and metals is a, is a key focus for us, um, but there's nothing in our solution that constrains us to that. So, for instance, some of our customers are asking us to move into uh, to oil. Uh, or even industrial products like tr trucks, equipment, spare parts, et cetera, because they need it for the operation. So it, it will, will branch out uh, organically. All right, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for joining us, Arnu. Um, I would like to now welcome our next presenter. Uh, our next company has seven operating gold mines in Brazil, Mexico, and the US, and a number of growth projects as well. I'm pleased to welcome Relin Bailey of Equinox Gold. Hi, Relin, how are you? I'm fine. Thanks, Steve. Uh, it's Roland. We're going to have to get that with you one day. <laughs> Roland, 
<laughs> That's fine. Good afternoon, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here to tell you about Equinox Gold and how we are building the premier America's gold producer. Next slide, please. Of course, since this event is being hosted by a law firm, I must remind everybody that I will be making a number of forward-looking statements today. Next slide. Equinox Gold is literally the fastest growing gold company in the world. We started the company at the very end of 2017. Ross Feedy, our chairman, had recently sold his green energy company and wanted to reinvest that money into gold. He had created Pan American Silver over 25 years to be the world's second largest silver producer, and he wanted to do it again in gold, and he wanted to do it quickly. Gold prices at the time were, I think, less than $1,200 per ounce, but Ross thought gold was ready to run, and he wanted to big, a big, build a big gold company quickly while both asset and equity prices were still low. Of course, if you want to build a mining company quickly, you need to do it through M&A. So we formed Equinox Gold at the end of 2017, and at the end of 2018, we bought the Mesquite Mine from New Gold, which was our first producing mine. At the end of 2019, we announced our acquisition of Leah Gold, which brought five producing mines to our portfolio. And at the end of 2020, we announced our acquisition of Premier Gold, which brought another producing mine, a world-class construction project in Ontario, and a number of exploration properties. Along the way, we've also spun out two new companies, sold two of our smaller mines, and had great exploration success. So in just four years, we've grown from a single asset developer to a diversified gold producer with seven producing mines, two construction projects underway, and a clear path to produce more than 1 million ounces of gold per year by around the end of 2024. Next slide, please. When all of our mines are in production, you'll see that our gold reserves and our gold production will be divided almost equally between the four mining-friendly countries of Canada, Brazil, Mexico, and the United States. This diversification greatly reduces both geopolitical risk and asset risk for our shareholders. If we have a setback at one of our mines, we still have six other mines that are in production and generating cash flow. Likewise, if there's a political issue in one of the countries, for example, in 2020, the government of Mexico shut down all of the mines for an entire quarter. So if there's an issue in one country, we still have production coming from mines in three other jurisdictions. So this diversification of having multiple mines in multiple countries was an important part of our strategy, and we've got that platform in place. Next slide, please. Since we started the company, I think we've got a pretty great track record of value creation. We bought Mesquite in 2018 for about $160 million. It's more than paid itself back with cash flow. And with exploration success, we've more than doubled the mine life at that project. Arizona was the first mine that we built. We achieved production in 2019 on time and on budget with a $160 million price tag. Arizona has generated close to $250 million in cash flow, and we expect to more than double the mine life at that project as well by developing additional open pit and underground deposits. We had a number of copper assets that weren't seeing any value in our gold portfolio. So in 2020, we spun them out into a separate company called Solaris Resources, and that has been an incredible success story. Solaris has grown to more than a billion dollar market cap and created great value for its shareholders and also for Equinox Gold as a corporate shareholder. Our 17% investment in that company is currently worth more than US $300 million. And then last year when we acquired Premier Gold, we spun out their Nevada-based gold assets into a separate company called I-80 Gold. We held on to 30% as a corporate investor. The rest went to shareholders and Ewan Downey and his team are doing a great job down there with exploration success and a new partnership with Nevada Gold Mines. So we've created value internally by developing our mines, externally by spinning out non-core assets, and we intend to continue with that track record by advancing our pipeline of development projects and servicing value from some of the smaller assets that are still in our portfolio. Next slide. And you can see that the work on the ground and through m and has translated into growth both in our, both in our gold reserves, <clears throat> excuse me, which have increased from less than 1 million ounces to more than 16 million ounces today, and also production growth. By either buying or building basically one mine per year, our production has grown from 20,000 ounces in 2018 to 600,000 ounces last year and close to 700,000 ounces this year and will be well over a million ounces in the next few years. Next slide. But this has not been growth for growth sake. Every transaction we've done has been accretive to our shareholders across a number of metrics, but most importantly on a per share basis. You can see that we've achieved resource growth, cash flow growth, and significant production growth on a per share basis. And that big blue bar on the right hand side shows how much that is going to jump when we've achieved our current growth plans. And the reason it jumps so much is because we are fully funded to advance all the projects in our pipeline. From our existing treasury and cash flow from our producing mines at these gold prices, we can achieve all of that growth without issuing any additional equity. Next slide. And we get asked quite often, why are we so set on building a major gold producer? It's because their market rewards scale. 
I already spoke briefly about the benefits of diversification with multiple mines spread across four countries, but the market also applies higher premiums to countries of scale, to companies of scale. There's no magic to the million ounce a year number. It just demonstrates scale, strong cash flow, less risk, lower overhead costs on a per ounce basis, and more cash flow available for shareholder returns. Right now, clearly, you can see from the left-hand side of this slide, Equinox Gold is trading at a significant discount to its peers. We should be trading around that 0.7 times multiple. And ultimately, when we've achieved our growth objectives, we should be trading right up there with the senior producers. But right now, we're trading at around 0.6 net asset value. That's partly because we had a setback at our big Los Filos project in Mexico with a couple of community blockades that sort of rattled investor confidence in that mine. I feel like those issues are hopefully behind us. We've been operating without incident since August of last year, but close to almost $1 billion of value for Los Filos has basically been knocked out of our share price. Also, as you can see from the right-hand side of this slide, a lot of our net asset value is tied up in future data growth projects. By advancing these projects, we're going to nearly double our production with 600,000 ounces of incremental production growth as each of these projects come online. And as those projects advance toward production and we demonstrate to the market that we're achieving those development milestones, we should be able to reduce that discount and start climbing our way back up to where we should be trading as a mid-tier producer. So we're a bit of a show me story right now, but even if the gold price doesn't change at all, by advancing these projects, we should see incremental increases to our market valuation as production grows. Next slide, please. However, all of the macro fundamentals do point to rising gold prices, which should just accelerate revaluation for Equinox Gold. All of the stimulus packages over the last couple of years, the explosion of sovereign debt, all of that debases currencies and results in inflationary pressures, and gold has always been the best hedge against inflation. We've also got strong demand. India imported 925 tons last year, which was a new record. China consumption was up 37%. The US Mint sold 39 tons to investors, which was the second highest on record. Central banks bought 500 tons and are continuing to buy. And the gold ETFs added 1 million ounces in the third week of January and have continued to buy. And then on the supply side, we see the same thing. There have been no major new discoveries. Mining companies are losing reserves. New development takes 20 years and the total gold supply has been flat since 2014. All of these are bullish for gold and will lead to higher gold prices. Yet the gold equities, as you can see from the chart below, are significantly undervalued. Historically, gold equities have often traded at two to three times their net present value, and right now they're trading at a fraction of that. And it's because we've seen money pulled away into alternative, alternative investments that were doing quite well. Lots of people got into the crypto space, meme stocks, NFTs, but we've started to see a transition that started in Q4 of last year. Bitcoin had a big correction. We all saw what happened with Facebook. So what are investors going to do with weakening markets and strong inflation? Why not buy gold, which has been a hedge against inflation for 5,000 years? Not everybody's going to do that, but gold doesn't need a lot of money to make a big move. Just a little bit of money sloshing from the major markets into gold will have a profound impact on the gold price, which will be a catalyst for higher equity prices. And the reason we wanted to build a big gold company is because the bigger you are, the more benefit you have from upside movement in the gold price. When you have large and growing production and you have large and growing reserves and resources, you give investors strong leverage to gold price upside. Say we had a 5% move in gold, so about $100 per ounce. And if we're producing 700,000 ounces of gold this year, which is our plan, that's $700 million straight to the bottom line. That's a real value add to the company. And that's going to give us a lot more than a 5% bump on our net value. By the same token, if we have 30 million ounces of gold in the ground, if gold goes up $100 an ounce, that's a $3 billion jump to the gross value of the company. Next slide, please. I think we've created an incredibly strong company in a short period of time, and we've got a really solid balance sheet as well. We've got more than $500 million of liquidity to fund our growth, with $300 million in cash and $200 million still to draw on our corporate revolver. We've got more than $300 million in cash flow margins, which grows every day as the gold price rises, and we've also got nearly half a billion dollar of investments that we can draw on if we need to. Although at these gold prices, we're fully funded from cash flow and our treasury. Next slide. We started out to build a multi-generational Vancouver-based gold company that will be self-sustaining and create value for our workforce, our company, community partners, and our shareholders for decades. We are all really excited about the future of this company and we have all personally invested. Every one of our executives and investors have invested in financings as we built the company and collectively we hold about eight and a half percent of the shares, which is one of the largest insider positions in the industry. We think like owners, we act like owners, and we are very aligned with our investors. Next slide. 
So I'll just do a quick little wrap up and then we can turn it over to Steve for questions. We are building, we believe, the premier America's gold producer. Right now we've got seven producing mines in four countries with strong cash flow. We've got more than 30 million ounces of gold in the ground. We've got the strongest growth profile of any company in the industry, all from existing assets. And we're fully funded to advance our pipeline of growth projects to achieve our vision, which is low cost, America's focused and million dollar gold ounce producer. And that is Equinox Gold. Great, thank you, Rolin. Pleasure. Appreciate it. Um, we do have a question here from the audience. Uh, is Equinox planning on doing more M&A to expand its portfolio or perhaps sell off some of the smaller assets? Yeah, we were just down at the BMO Gold Conference and that was one of the first questions we always got. The last four years have really been about growing the company and creating that platform that gave us solid cash flow and solid uh, growth in the future, but that's behind us now. We've got the assets in place that we need to achieve that million ounce per year target. So now we're really turning our focus inward and it's about accretive growth, incremental production growth from the assets that we already have on hand. We do also have a number of smaller assets in our portfolio. For example, when we bought Premier Gold, we got a portfolio of um, early stage exploration projects in Ontario that are quite interesting. Um, we've already sold off our smaller mines, so we probably won't be selling any mines in the near term, but we also have a portfolio of royalties, which fetch a good price in the market these days. So we will look at opportunities to surface value from those non-core assets, just like we did with Solaris Resources and with the I-80 Gold spin out. Great. Okay. Thanks a lot, Berlin. Um, and thank you for telling us about Equinox. Thanks very much. Bye. Uh, okay, on to our next presenter. So our next presenter, Vizsla Silver, is focused on advancing its flagship 100% owned Panuco Silver and Gold project located in Sinaloa, Mexico. To date, Vizsla has completed over 100,000 meters of drilling at Panuco, leading to the recently announced maiden resource of over 100 million ounce silver equivalent. For 2022, Vizsla has budgeted 120,000 meters of resource discovery based drilling designed to upgrade and expand the maiden resource, as well as test other high priority targets. Um, I'd like to introduce Mike Pettengall from Vizsla Silver. Mike's a geologist with over 10 years experience working in both pre-producing and operating mines, as well as the capital markets. Prior to Vizsla, Mike spent the last four years working in equity research at Canaccord Genuity, covering precious and base metal explorers and developers. Welcome, Mike. Thanks, Steve. And uh, thank you everyone for joining the, the call today. Uh, again, my name is Mike Pettingill. I'm the VP of Business Development and Strategy for, for Visla Silver. Next slide, please. We'll be going over some forward-looking statements. Um, I, I, anybody should take their time if you're interested and, and read these over. Next slide. So why Visla Silver? We really do have this emerging discovery down in Mexico. It's a past producing district. Um, and it represents one of the highest grade silver primary discoveries in the world. And I'll, I'll touch on that point in a bit. We've got a highly experienced management and board bringing together over a combined 185 years of experience in, in exploration, development, operations, and the capital markets. We have multiple av avenues to re-rate here. We're targeting H2 2022 for an update to our maiden resource, which we put out just this week. Uh, with the optionality to expedite and fast track into a producing scenario, given uh, existing permitted infrastructure on site. Uh, we also are a very ex aggressive explorer, one of the most aggressive in the industry, 120,000 meter drill program ongoing with 13 drill rigs. And we're well positioned to execute. We have $38 million in the bank and zero debt. Next slide, please. So a quick company snapshot here, 148 million shares outstanding, um, 38 million, as I mentioned in the bank. If you look at our, our shareholders there, 45% is held by institutions, including, you know, Sprott, Fourth Sale, some of these bigger names, uh, and 16% is held by management and insiders. So we certainly have skin in the game. Uh, analyst coverage, we've got $6 handle from Canaccord Genuity, uh, $380 from, from Phil Kerr at PI and Michael Gray at Agentis Capital. That gives a $4.90 Canadian consensus. Um, next slide, please. You can read over through our senior management team, but again, this is everybody's got a really strong tenure of 10 years plus as a mining professional in, in, in the space. Next slide. 
And a couple of names that I'll just want to highlight here. Craig Perry is our chairman. He's an industry veteran. He's currently the chairman of Skeena Resources. He's the former CEO and founder of ISO Energy and NextGen Energy. And he's been a, a, a major member of EMR Capital and spent 10 years as a um, development geologist for Rio Tinto. Him and our, our president and CEO, Michael Connor, formed the company back in 2018, following their success with uh, a Cobalt One Energy, which was a uh, which was an early stage, smaller scale company that they were able to transact on. Uh, Charles Funk also is important to note here. He's also the CEO of Heliostar Metals, and he's actually credited for the majority of the discoveries we've made to date at Panuco. The last name here is Simon Schmerlich. He's the current COO of Asenko Engineering with a great experience building, developing, commissioning mines down in Latin America, and particularly Asenko's building uh, Las Chispas, Silvercrest project, just up the, up the way. Next slide. Something that's very important to us is the ESG component. Uh, you can't really run. You can, you know, you can run, do the best job you can from operating a mine or running a, a mining company in Vancouver, but it all comes down to the people in country on the ground. And, and this is very, very important to us. We create a, a, a safe work environment. We've got over 400,000 hours man hours with, with, with no lost time incidents. And it is an absolute uh, mandate for us to be committed to responsible mining done right. We currently have three, uh, we have six ajitos on the property, three of which we've signed exploitation agreements with. These are 35 year agreements. Most of you might know, you know, you can get your permits from the government to get in and, and be able to do, you know, exploration and, and, and progress your mind, but it's actually the, the local communities that allow you to advance a project. So we have very strong relationships. Next slide, please. So to the project itself, it's located in a fantastic area of, of Mexico. It's a well-established jurisdiction, safe jurisdiction. Uh, it's about an hour drive east of Mazatlan. We're about 80 kilometers away from First Majestic's flagship San Dimas mine, located in Durango. And this is a past producing district. Um, you know, there's uh, it's over 6,800 hectare land package. And it's the, the mining history dates back to the conquistadors almost 400 years ago. And it's never been systematically explored on a consolidated basis until Visla acquired options on the property, which we've now exercised and, and owned the entire district outright. As I mentioned, it is permitted with access to infrastructure given the brownfields past producing nature and it benefits from power, water, road access, as you can see, bisect the property. We've got two highways. In fact, our, our main discovery, Napoleon there, you can see in the lower left corner is right off the highway. And we are advancing these two primary hydrate discoveries, uh, which we've now delineated maiden resources on, which we hope to upgrade these resources in the second half this year. And we're doing that with 13 drill rigs, six focused on resource upgrading or delineation, and seven focused primarily for exploration of the district. Next slide, please. So looking at Napoleon, which makes up roughly 49% of the maiden resource, um, this is really the bulk of, of our focus for further upgrading and expanding this maiden resource. As you can see in the bottom right corner here, this is just a snapshot. On a combined basis, you're looking at just over 100 million ounces silver equivalent. Um, next slide. And again, this is just a snapshot of, of the Folsom uh, resource. In, in total, we've got eight veins that we've included in this resource made up of 13 wireframes. It's important to note every single one of these wireframes that made up this resource remain open. So there's lots of runway for us to continue incrementally expanding this first interim resource. But what I really want to point your direction to is the, the, the table on the right. We bid our resource at a base case cutoff grade, and that's essentially where you're going to draw the line for, for economics. Um, you know, mineralization that's below that 150 gram per ton doesn't make it into the economic cutoff grade. But I'd like to point your direction to the 250 number, which nets you roughly on a combined basis around 80 million ounces grading 515 grams per ton. Next slide, please. 
So how does we how do we stack up, and how does this maiden resource stack up? Well, on a size basis, you can see we we stack up very well against a cross section of explorers and developers in the silver space, and especially on the grade point. You know, if you look, we're second only to Silvercrest, which is a far more advanced project currently being constructed, which has had many rounds of infill drilling and, uh, you know, been able to really bring up that, that resource grade and define it. It also includes factors like dilution and, um, you know, development costs, mining method. These things inherently will push your cutoff grade up as you advance. Us, this is our maiden interim resource. And so when you look at this 250 gram per ton number, this is closer to what you'd actually have to, to, to be mining based on this maiden resource. And as you can see there, the grade increases by around 42%. So our project is very attractive from just an exploration and developer point of view. But when we consider the, the, the major producers out there and their limited development pipeline, we believe we can add a accretive value very quickly to a number of these different producers. Next slide, please. So where are we going to take things from here? And here's Napoleon. Again, I mentioned it makes about 49% of this maiden resource base. This project, and as I mentioned, all these wireframes remain open. And looking at Napoleon, it's still open at depth. Typical epithermal vein systems, which are these near-surface hydrothermal silver and gold rich systems, particularly in Mexico, they extend to around 600 to 800 meter depth. The overall resource combined basis is sitting at around 400 meters depth. So we do have lots of room to, to almost double this on the depth profile. But the mineralization is really trending in this particular corridor, a long strike and down plunge to the south. And that's where this high grade plug of Guyanero sitting up there in the purple, that's where mineralization is trending. And so if you can go to the next slide, Here's our, our, our geologist, this is our technical team's guide. I, I hesitate to call it a model because it's more of a guide of where we might sit in the profile, the epithermal profile. And this, this slide is based on metal zonation. It's based on geology. But as you can see, we're, we've got a gold rich zone, which would represent that you're more shallow in the system, a precious metals rich core. And then as you go to the north, we've got an uptick in base metals, which would typify that you're in a, a deeper setting. And so for us, where we're trying to explore moving forward is a long strike to the south there towards this Ojo de Agua zone and down plunge. So a long strike and down plunge beneath the gold rich shallow zone. And that's where we're going to continue to expand. And I, and I ask you to pay attention to, the, to your news wires in the next few weeks. We're hoping to put out some, some good results there. Next slide. This is a great slide. We're very happy about this. This just shows the progression that we've taken this project for over the last 16 months. Uh, that blue dot up there in the, the corner, that's the discovery hole. And as you can see, we've grown this from a, a small blob to a true panel or curtain of mineralization. And there's two points to make on that. You know, the first is this thing is largely continuous for an epithermal system, which tends to have higher grade plugs, it's largely continuous. And given this orientation, it really lends itself to, to mineability and having many open mining faces. That in turn can feed a higher scope milling facility. Next slide. So looking at our second uh, major resource area is Tejitos. Now that plan map in the top right corner, that long left on the left there, that's Napoleon. So this is located around 500 meters to the east of Napoleon. It's a slight different orientation and it doesn't have the base metal component as much that Napoleon does. This is primarily precious metals. And there's, uh, there's still a lot of run room here as well. We've also drawn on this 800 meter depth profile just to give you a sense of the run room remaining at Tejitos as well. Next slide. An interesting thing about Tejitos is as you move to the north, mineralization tends to uh, thin out. But as you come up section closer to surface, and this is identified in this long section, we have a different orientation in the hanging wall that presents as a near flat lying, very, very wide 
vein. Now this vein, you can see some of these intervals, 82 meters true width grading 226 grams per ton silver equivalent with a high grade core of 230 or 2.3 meters grading almost three and a 3.7 kilos. These are open pitable targets. So it really opens up the district for us to continue exploring. And I will say Copala added roughly 18 million ounces into this maiden resource off a very limited amount of drilling. So stay tuned for developments on Copala as well. Next slide. So the district remains vastly underexplored. Everything we've really talked about today is located in this bottom left-hand corner in the west area. We've got around 75 kilometers of known uh, inferred vein strike and where our resources are represent less than 5% of that vein strike. To date, we've only drilled 28% of the known targets, but we've had fantastic success all around the district uh, through limited drilling and lots of soil samples. This year with our 120,000 meter drill program, again, six, six rigs will be targeting that Western area solely just expanding those resource bases. Uh, but seven rigs will be scattered out doing true exploration. Last year was really focused on delineating a resource, putting an anchor of value to the company. And this year we're getting back to our roots, which is true exploration. What brought us to the district originally and our major exploration thesis was use historic workings to vector to new mineralization. And that's proven to be very successful for us. Next slide. Additionally, besides that original thesis, we also have electromagnetics which you know, is, a, is not typically used, but we've had fantastic success lining up uh, you know, a, a fixed loop trial survey on Napoleon, which lit up the known mineralization we had, and we've got a whole host of new targets to continue testing. Next slide, please. So what we've achieved, we now have a maiden resource estimate on the project. We've got initial metallurgy completed, showing fantastic numbers. We have 100% ownership of the district and we continue to drill very aggressively. Ongoing steps rem remain to be preliminary met testing at Tejitos, which is ongoing. We're anticipating those results in the second quarter of the year. And as well as these initial geotech and hydro, it's including baseline env environmental work to really in the background, put this project up on a pedestal from a development standpoint. So the next steps are to do an airborne, full project airborne and EM survey in the second quarter of this year, as well as deliver an updated resource in the second half. Next slide. And so considerable re-rating potential, this is an EM or EV per ounce metric. You can see here where we sit relative to our peer group. We believe that our direct comparables are Los Ricos, uh, Gold Gold's project and Las Chipas, which is Silvercrest project. They trade at a, a current premium on a combined basis. They are far more de-risked than we are. But as we continue to de-risk our project, these guys have technical studies out. If you look down at the bottom, if you subscribe to that, we, we, we demand a serious re-rating given this market cap delta. It's 300 million market cap up to, uh, you know, if you look at gold, gold, they're trading at 634. Next slide. And this is just a comparison again of a producing asset, San Dimas construction, which is Silvercrest. We are in the same geology. We're in the, the same timing of mineralization. We're all located in this, this structure in Mexico on the Western coast of Mexico. We just have far less exploration and knowledge of our district than these other two. Next slide. So to wrap things up, why Visla Silver? We have multiple near-term catalysts, the number one being our aggressive drill program and the discovery potential that comes along with it. You know, it's underexplored, only 33 out of 117 targets have been tested. And this EM that correlates to known mineralization has only been flown on a postage stamp of our huge district. So once we fly the whole district, we should have a whole litany of new targets to continue testing. And we've got this expedited pathway to production, which sets us apart from the majority of our peers. Um, the 100% ownership of permitted on-site on facilities could really fast track us into a situation where we're generating free cash flow to continue ongoing exploration and development without needing to go back to the market to, to dilute. And again, we're well financed for up to for up to two years of ongoing exploration and development. So with that, I'll, I'll turn it back to you, Steve. Great, thanks, Mike. Uh, a lot of exciting stuff going on. Um, I do have a question here. Um, of the planned 120,000 meters uh, for this year's drill program, 
how many of that will be devoted to resource drilling versus exploration? Yeah, so it's about on a meterage basis, we've got seven rigs devoted to exploration. Um, of the, on a meterage basis, it's around 70% of the meters will be resource delineation and upgrading, and 30% will be focused on exploration. And it's really just because you, know, you have to do sound science and move the drill rigs. Uh, it's not as easy as just targeting a certain area and uh, keeping the rigs static. Right, okay, thanks Mike. Appreciate you uh, joining us here today. Thanks everyone. All right, uh, that was Vizsla Silver. Um, next up, uh, I would like to uh, have our next presenter is well on their way to becoming Ghana's next big producer of gold. Uh, this week, they just raised over 102 million funds that will be used for an initial mine development. I'd like to introduce Double Douglas Macquarie. Uh, Douglas has 40 years of mineral exploration experience, including almost 30 years in West Africa. He's been responsible for the discover acquisition of gold deposits in both Canada and in Ghana. Douglas is the founder of Asante Gold Corporation and a member of the Association of Engineers and Geoscientists of British Columbia. He also serves as an independent director at IC Capital Light Corp, which owns and operates Capital Light Research, a weekly and monthly subscription-based research company focused on the gold and silver commodity prices. Welcome, Douglas. Thank you, Steve. Thanks for the introduction. Hello, hello, everybody. Uh, thanks for tuning in. I'd like to give a very short uh, introduction to our Bibiani project in Ghana and uh, <clears throat> some of the other things we're working on here. So uh, next slide, please. Okay, so um, Asante a year ago was a, a sleepy little junior listed on the Canadian Stock Exchange at hmm, the bottom of the slide there is about 10 cents, I think. And in just uh, the last six months, uh, we've had a, quite, a, quite a ride up to $1.71 a share. It was basically on the back of some capital raises that we did in Ghana. Uh, what we're doing here is something quite unique. Uh, we've all heard about resource nationalization and all the various issues that that can bring. Uh, in Asante's case, we said, well, if you can't beat them, join them. So we're currently sitting with 47% of our shares owned by Ghanaians. And uh, we've raised, uh, as Steve mentioned, 102 million recently. Uh, 80 million of that was, uh, was raised in Ghana and uh, it was done at a 25% premium to our market price. And there was no warrant. So, the, the, uh, you know, so what we're doing here is really quite unheard of. And what do we need all the cash for? Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, okay, so that shows uh, the capital structure a little bit and uh, number of shares issued. Our market cap's around, I think around $400 million now Canadian. Uh, next slide. Okay, here's some highlights. Uh, basically, we purchased the Bibiani gold mine from Resolute in August of, uh, of uh, 2021. And uh, since then, we've... Uh, decided that instead of developing it as an underground mine, which Resolute was, uh, was, was focused on, they did a super job on all the community, uh, community relations and uh, the maintenance of the facility. And, uh, you know, so it was basically a turnkey for us. And we basically said, well, we think there's some more life in the, uh, in the underground mine, I should say in the open pit opportunities. Uh, Resolute outlined a two and a half million uh, ounce resource. Uh, Bibiani has been in production uh, for more than a hundred years. Uh, it's produced more than five million ounces, and uh, most of that was uh, was uh, was from underground. Uh, the workings go down eight hundred meters. The ore body is two kilometers long, and so we said, okay, let's go back in and see if we can do something with the with the open pit. Uh, opportunity. Uh, our recent funding uh, was to, to pay uh, the second payment to, uh, to Resolute. So we've paid 60 million of the 90 million that we owed them. The next payment due is in August of, of this year. Uh, next slide, please. Next, next slide, thank you. 
Okay, so that, that shows roughly where we're sitting. The uh, you can see off on the left uh, the red arrow. Yeah, the red arrow Bibiani, Asante Gold, and uh, the other uh, middle arrow is our Keyhole project, our Fahiakoba project, and it cuts across to the Kubi project. Those projects from from west to east are, is only hundred kilometers, and this is right in the center of Ghana's major gold producing uh, properties. Um, as I say, Viviani's produced 5 million ounces. Just to the south of us is the uh, Kinross Chirano mine, produced, I think, about 2.5 million ounces. And of course, there's a uh, new Matsahafo up to the north, a 7 million ounce deposit. Uh, our Kubi project, I should say, our Kubi project is just south of Obuasi. That's a 30, 30 million ounce producer with another 25 million ounces in resources. Uh, our Fahia Cobra property is just sitting north of Perseus's Etican mine. So we, we're certainly location, location, location. Ghana's uh, Africa's second largest gold producer. I'm lying to you. Ghana is now Africa's largest gold producer. And uh, so we're certainly in the right location. Uh, next slide, please. Next slide. Right, so once we acquired the property in August, we, uh, we started a mill uh, process plant rehabilitation. It's a $26 million project, we're 60% complete. When we finish this, the mill will be to 2021 standards. It's a 3 million ton per annum plant uh, where we've brought in absolutely new uh, gravity uh, uh, co concentration, uh, uh, Nelson concentrator, we brought in a new gecko intensive leach reactor. Uh, so we're basically taking the, uh, the processing up to 21, 2021 standards. Uh, we're currently mining. The uh, mining started two weeks ago. I was going to get to one slide in particular with slide 10, but basically the long story is Bibiani has produced 5 million ounces. It has a 3 million ton per year plant on site, which will be fully reconstructed by July of this year, and we will pour our first gold. When Bibiani closed down in 2005, uh, it had previously been producing 250,000 ounces per year as a tier one asset for Anglo, uh, Anglo Gold Ashanti. And they had a pit failure, and basically low price of gold, the place went into care and maintenance. It went to sleep, and 17 years later, we're waking it up. And there is no reason that we can't wake it up and continue production at 200 to 250,000 ounces per year. So we're on an incredibly fast timeline to just wake up this, this giant mine. We have a two and a half million ounce resource. Uh, the structure is two kilometers long. The deepest workings are 800 meters. So we believe this mine will probably be there for the next 50 years. It's been there 100 years. The Ghanaian mines tend to go to depth. So we're very excited about it. and. Uh, yeah, so sorry I wasn't able to uh, complete the slideshow there, but thank you, thanks everybody for uh, bearing with me. Yeah, no problem. Um, hey, quick question. Um, you've obviously had a lot of success in West Africa. Um, what is it that you like so much about that jurisdiction? Okay, well, Ghana is a particular part of West Africa. It's the British English portion of, of West Africa. So British common law, drive on the right side of the road, they speak English. That's very good. The other thing is the West African craton, the, 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 the deposits are very large. They're not small. They're very large and they're vertical. So you can take two and a half million ounces out of a pit and then spend the next 20 years uh, going down on the deposits uh, with another two and a half or five million ounces. Second thing is the grade. Our Bibiani is around three grams per ton which is roughly triple most of the open cut gold mines in Ghana. So it's early payback and all, and all of that. The third thing, it's a, it's a, it's a very stable, a stable uh, uh, place to do business. I've worked here for 30 years. We found about 24 million ounces uh, in companies we've got, developed and worked on. So uh, I think it's just a great, a great place to be, you know, uh, uh, call it the Carlin, call it, call it the Carlin of, of Africa. Mm. Now I'd like to skip ahead a little bit uh, from West Africa 
We uh, are now going to Barksdale Resources. Um, Barksdale is an advanced precious and base metal explorer with assets in Arizona and Mexico. Uh, I'd like to introduce the president and CEO, Rick Trotman. Uh, Rick is a professional geologist with a broad range of experience within the mining industry, having worked in both buy side and sell side positions, as well as technically focused responsibilities with major mining companies. Rick was previously with Resource Capital Funds, a leading mining focused private equity firm, where he was involved in executing a broad range of investments spanning the precious base and minor metal spaces and was also responsible for establishing and managing the firm's portfolio and exploration investments. Thank you for joining us, Rick. Thanks, Steve. I uh, yeah, often miss the small stuff. Um, so Barksdale, as I was saying, and you couldn't hear, is a, is a base metal exploration company focused on the desert Southwest in both the United States and in Mexico. Uh, we trade on the TSXV under the symbol BRO, BRO or on the OTCQX under BRKCF. Uh, next slide. I'll be going through some forward-looking statements today. Um, just a reminder here for everyone to do their homework before they invest. You can read these at your leisure. This is up on our website, www.barksdaleresources.com. You can go there. You can not only look at this slide deck, but you can sign up for meetings. You can, you can see my calendar and take meetings um, directly from the website. Next slide. So, so what is Barksdale? Why should you buy Barksdale stock? Why should you invest um, and kind of sit with, you know, some very large shareholders that we have that are, are patient long-term money? Well, the reason is twofold. One, we have an exciting portfolio of uh, uh, assets in the United States um, in the Patagonia district. This is effectively a, a district that we control about 50% of. The other 50% is controlled by a large multi-billion dollar market cap multinational mining company called South 32. They're developing a mine right next door uh, and we have the other part of the resource, so to speak. Uh, and then uh, 100% uh, owned asset that we have an option over is the San Javier Copper Project in Sonora, Mexico, where we just finished up a drilling program. Very exciting stuff. Uh, as you can see here, some of the initial results that we had were quite compelling. We believe that this could be a mine in the next you know, a couple of years. Um, and then with the copper price that we have right now, um, it's a very exciting project and, and really adds some oomph to what we're doing corporately. Next slide. So a quick snapshot of Barksdale. Uh, we're a relatively small company. We're $23 million market cap today, trading at around 39 cents. Maybe it's 24 million. Uh, we have about $3 million in cash, including a convertible note that we have in place with Delbrook. Uh, here in uh, Vancouver, they're a very large uh, mining focused um, uh, fund. Um, when we did that deal, we were down at probably 25 cents. So we're up a good 40, 45% since doing that deal here, you know, the past six weeks ago, I believe. Uh, we have a very strong corporate register. Um, about 30% of our stock sits in the hands of uh, corporates, including Tech Resources, who is our largest shareholder, as well as Cisco Development Corp. Um, each have a, about nine and a half nine and a half to 10% of the stock. Uh, we also have a very strong institutional presence, um, including uh, Delbrook, US Global, Metalist Capital, Crestcat Capital, Eric Sprott, um, and management has about 5%. I personally have about one and a half percent of the company. I've bought all of my stock on market. I'll continue to buy on market when I have uh, liquidity to do so. Um, and so I like to put my money where my mouth is. I believe that there's a lot of upside to Barksdale and I'll continue to buy. Next slide. I won't go too in depth on the uh, the team, but uh, just understand that we have a great team that's very good at what they do. They have decades of experience in their subject matter uh, expertise, um, and they are going to help us push these projects forward very fast and very competently. Next slide. So, Barksdale. We have two portfolios of assets, as I mentioned earlier, one in Southern Arizona that you can see here, the Patagonia district. This is just north of the border with Mexico uh, and our San Javier project, uh, just a couple hours of way uh, in Sonora, Mexico, very blessed logistically right off the highway. Next slide. So let's start with San Javier because that's the active project that we have. 
Uh, we have an option to gain 100% control of this project. It's a very well-structured option. We have several years to complete it. The details are in the appendix of this deck, so please do go there to take a deeper look. Um, this is a project that has seen a decent amount of drilling probably 10 to 12 years ago. Um, we were able to pick this project up from a private owner um, and we uh, have started moving it forward on our own. Um, there are four concession blocks here. We're focused in on the Cerro Verde concession block, as you can see in the lower left-hand corner. That's where we just completed a 5,000 meter drilling program. Uh, next slide. Uh, the first assays from that program were quite exciting. Uh, we had over 100 meters of 0.63% copper, as well as some really compelling gold intercepts that came out of this. Uh, mind you, what we're looking for here is oxide copper. And this is shallow right at surface. And these first holes that we put into to Cerro Verde, and, and quite honestly, the rest of the holes from that program that we've released so far have been quite good. I don't think that we've missed on a single hole as of yet, and hopefully the last seven or eight holes that we have coming uh, will not make a liar out of me. Uh, we expect to have the final holes coming from this program here in the next probably two to three weeks. Um, and we will then very quickly move into resource calculation mode. I know that we're finalizing the geologic model right now, and that will be used uh, as kind of the, the, the base that the uh, resource will be calculated off of. Next slide. So uh, Cerro Verde is the first uh, uh, tenement that we're going to be looking at. This is the zone that had the most historic drilling. We just completed 5,000 meters of drilling there. We have additional targets on this property. Think of it like a, a string of pearls, with Cerro Verde being the first that we're going to tackle. We have uh, projects within just a, a very sh short few kilometers away called Mesa Grande, which has historic copper intercepts as well, and La Trinidad, uh, which is just another kilometer away from Mesa Grande. So much more to come from this district. We're taking a district scale approach. And I will remind you all, if you don't know, that one of our largest shareholders of Cisco Development owns most of the land um, to the east of our project, and they're building a gold mine right next door. So um, within the district, we have friends, so to speak. Next slide. Uh, well, I'll skip this slide and go to the next one for the purpose of time. As you can see here on this slide, this is a copper oxide deposit. Most of the mineralization sticking right up out of the ground. All that green color that you see on the rock, that's copper oxide. This would be a, a, a type of deposit that would be mined and processed via heap leach. Uh, unlike most copper in the world, it's, uh, you know, you, you form a concentrate and you ship that concentrate from the mine all around the world, this would actually plate cathode right on site. And we're very excited to push this towards being a mine. We have some of those metallurgical tests that are wrapping up right now that will give us the data necessary to actually work out those economics and show you that this will be a profitable mine. So some of those news flow items are gonna be coming over the next couple of weeks, up to probably six weeks out. So stay tuned for that. Those MET uh, studies are ongoing up in, in Reno, Nevada with McClellan, who does this type of MET work um, for, uh, for the decades, quite honestly, and they're very good at it. So well, we're very happy with the work that's been doing, going on so far. The leaching has, uh, the leach testing has been completed, and so now they're unloading columns and doing the final assays right now. Uh, we expect to have the resource on this deposit done in the next couple of weeks. So that'll be another news flow item coming out on San Javier. Uh, and then we'll move into a preliminary economic study at, at some point here once the resource is done. Next slide. Uh, so the, the, the big enchilada at Barksdale. Uh, this is what the company was founded on. This is what we think will drive the most value for our shareholders. Uh, and that's the Patagonia district. Uh, we have assembled a, a, a very large land position in this very hot and exciting exploration district. As you can see here, we have a number of different concession blocks outlined in dark blue uh, that are within and surrounded by South 32, uh, whose concessions are shown in light gray. Uh, the difference between our two concessions are that uh, we uh, systematically acquired our ground over a couple of year period, they paid $2.1 billion in an all cash deal to buy their position in this district. Next slide. 
Uh, and the reason that they did that is because there was a world-class discovery that was made right on the edge of our property and theirs called the Taylor deposit. This is perhaps the world's largest carbonate replacement deposit. It's a massive ore body that contains significant amount of zinc, lead, and silver. Uh, they just put out a uh, pre-feasibility study here a couple of weeks ago that had a $1.7 billion capital expenditure uh, to bring this deposit into production. They're forecasting to be in production within the next four or five years. That sits immediately adjacent to our property. And in fact, we share a deposit. The discovery holes for the Taylor deposit were actually drilled on Barksdale's ground back in the 1980s. We are currently undergoing a, a permitting process with the US government to allow us to get in there to drill our side of the project to show the investing world that we do in fact have something that's significant and something that is going to be of great value. So uh, we are finalizing those permits you know, over the next couple of months and, and hopefully uh, we will be drilling uh, later this year. Next slide. And as you can see here on this slide, this is our target priority area. It's the, the portion of the property that's immediately to the east of the Sunnyside Porphyry, which you can see there as that large orange blob. That was the heat engine that caused the formation of all of the mineralization in this area. Uh, that mineralization extends up to three and a half kilometers to the east. This is where we think that we're gonna have kind of the roots to this very large system. The very high grades, the very continuous grades um, that you know, we often see in kind of a SCARN transitioning into a carbonate replacement type zone. Um, the, the ore body next door has a, a combined lead zinc grade of around seven, seven and a half percent with two ounces per ton silver. We expect to have grades that are much, much higher than that as we get closer to the pore free source. And that's what we're looking forward to, to drilling later this year. Next slide. And to give you a bit of a, a view in 3D, you can see those large red blobs that represents the, the, the mineralization on South 32's side of the fence. This is taken for public information. So mind you, this is just gonna be a representation. But on our side of the property, which is left of that blue line that says property boundary, we have a very significant copper porphyry that was drilled historically, maybe six holes into it. It's very large. Um, the, the grades are probably in the 0.3 copper uh, range, um, but what is very important is that was the heat source that created all this high grade mineralization that comes shooting off to the east. And this gap between the porphyry copper and the property boundary is that sweet spot that we're looking to explore. Um, and we have hits in that zone, including 17 meters of 1% copper and 17% zinc with you know, 10 ounces per ton silver. These are extremely high grade intercepts. Um, if you advance the slide, uh, this target zone that we have, uh, next slide, please. This target zone that we have, you have to think about it. It's not only the kilometer strike length from east-west, but it also wraps around the porphyry. So anywhere that, we're, that we have the right types of rocks around that porphyry, we have an opportunity to build high grade resources. And so we're very excited when we look at the amount of real estate that we have to build high grade tons. We're very excited and we can't wait to get drilling on this. Next slide. Uh, the, the, just to give you a bit of a, an overview from surface, this picture shows you from standing on the Sunnyside property, looking onto the South 32 property of all the activities that are going on next door. Since acquiring the project for $2 billion in cash, Sound 32 has put hundreds of millions of dollars into it. Uh, they're gonna be putting in four to $500 million to dewater the mine and build the underground infrastructure over the next couple of years as they come into production in 2027. We're right next door, we share an ore body. Um, we just need to get in there and drill and show the world how much of that ore body we do in fact control and hopefully show that we have very high grades and lots of nice tons. Next slide. So if you would like some additional information, please reach out, contact us. Like I said before, if you go to the website, you can schedule appointments with myself or Terry Ann Welleke, the VP of, Explore, of Communications. Um, and just a reminder, we trade on the TSXV under BRO and the OTCQX BRKCF. So if you enjoyed this presentation, please go do some more research and don't forget to buy some bro. Thank you for your time.
Rick, thank you very much. Um, I have a question here. Um, sure. So uh, the discovery holes at Sunnyside show significant high grade, but are quite deep. Generally, very deep resources pose economic stress to a project. Why should investors not be concerned about the depth here? Yeah, if we were out in the middle of nowhere, the depth could be a concern, but you have to envision that there's going to be two shafts that are a couple of hundred meters away to the east. They're going to go down to a considerable depth. The, the ultimate depth of the mineralization on our side of the fence isn't going to be an issue because of all the infrastructure that's being built right next door. Perfect. Okay. Thank you very much, Rick. And uh, thanks for joining us today. Of course. Thanks for having me. All right. That was Rick Trotman with Barksdale Resources. Uh, our final presentation of the day is focused on advancing two gold properties in Canada's Yukon. I'm excited to have Tara Christie join us from Banyan Gold. Tara has had over 20 years of experience in the exploration and mining business. She became the president and CEO of Banyan in 2016. Prior to that, she was president of privately owned Gimlix Gold Mines, one of the Yukon's largest placer mining operations, and was involved in consulting for exploration, mining, environmental assessment, government, community, and First Nations relations. Tara is, a, is active in nonprofits and charities, including being president of the charity Every Student Every Day that works to improve attendance in Yukon schools. Uh, please welcome Tara Christie from Banyan Gold. Thank you so much, Steve. It's great to be here. And thank you for everyone for staying to the end of, of this session. Uh, Banyan Gold is a, a really exciting Yukon-focused gold exploration company. As you said, I've been running it uh, since 2016. So just five years in now, we're really um, starting to move things forward very quickly. The image on the front of this slide is, is actually uh, our project area. And what you can see, and you'll see in lots of our slides, is we benefit from exceptional infrastructures, a main road, highway through it, um, even cell phone service here, and nice low rolling topography. That's, uh, we envision this as potentially an open pit heat beach mining project, just like our neighbor down the road in our direct comparable Victoria goal. So on the next slide, you'll see that, you know, I'm gonna make some forward looking statements. I'm an excited uh, exploration company and we get up every day uh, getting out and looking for, for new gold resources. So please uh, read these forward looking statements and check our website. And on the next slide is our main investment highlights. We believe our ORMAC project, and we're focused mostly on our ORMAC project right now that started due to COVID, but really we are adding ounces here very, very quickly. This initial resource that you see that we put out in May of 2020 cost us $2 per ounce in exploration cost. We are a very focused uh, exploration company, really adding value through the drill bit right now. I have three drills turning right now. You think of Yukon stories and you don't think of drilling in, uh, in early March, but we actually started in, in January and uh, this year after ending our season last year in, on December 20th. So that gives us a huge advantage in being able to advance this project very, very quickly. Uh, got a great team, management team with a great track rate record of success. I'll talk about them very briefly. We're right beside two producing mines that were permitted uh, in the last two years. That's exceptional. There's not very many jurisdictions where you can get through the permitting process and uh, being next to mines, they always say the best place to find a new mine is right next to the head frame of an old one. I talked about those roads and the power and you'll see them in all of our slides as we move forward. This really is a tier one jurisdiction where you can permit. We have a first nation here that knows mining and has been involved in permitting lots of other projects. Um, so on the next slide, I'll show you um, our team really briefly. You know, I'm a geotechnical engineer by training and we have all of the um, skills to be able to move this project forward. We won't belabor that. Please reach out if you want to learn some more about that. And on the next slide, um, uh, you'll see our corporate structure. We're very well funded. That enabled us to be able to get out drilling quickly this year. We signed our drill contracts back in October, and it's going to be a very competitive year with this gold price. We're very excited with uh, the team that we have assembled and, and that we've already started and have our assays into the lab before others. We benefit from having some great solid shareholders, uh, like one of my uh, other um, uh, colleagues today. We have a Cisco development at 5%. Victoria Gold is 13%. 
uh, insiders hold 9%. And personally, as the third CEO of this company, I hold 5.5%, uh, including putting in $850,000 to maintain that in this last 18 months in financing. So uh, also Franklin Gold and Precious Metals, good long holding fund and 11% other institutions. Uh, we're covered by some analysts, Brock Saylor, uh, notably, and his you can see his price target there and, and follow up with him. On the next slide, you'll see uh, an image of our actual resource uh, or where it's located, our Ormac Gold Project near, um, near Victoria Gold and Alexco. The Yukon's a great jurisdiction to be working in with lots of majors making investments in the last couple of years. And the next slide shows you where uh, our resource is located. And there you can see the infrastructure, that main highway through the property year round maintain the power line. It was actually just rebuilt in January of 2021. It was 139 kilovolt, but only energized to 68 until there's some additional customers for the line. That's exceptional. Um, you can see our resource here. We used a $1,500 gold price, US price in 2020. Uh, deepest part of the pit was 200 meters, low strip ratio. And at that time, the bulk of our resource was at airstrip. And I think you'll see in the resource update that we're about to put out that the bulk of the resource growth has been at Powerline. And that's because Powerline, we've been able to expand it so rapidly. These roads are going to get uh, additional work from the Yukon government. They have pledged $63 million starting this summer to start improving these highways. Um, that And this, this power line goes right to the hydroelectric dam, just 50 kilometers away. And there's even fiber optic cable uh, out to Victoria Gold. So we've been focused uh, since this resource in 2020 on expanding uh, the inferred resource. So we have almost 40 kilometers of drilling now with an additional 4,000 that we've drilled this year as well. Uh, the drilling from 2020 and 2021 will go into this resource update that we're planning for Q2. And on the next page, um, I will note that the top there, there was the uh, comparable to Victoria Gold. Their life of mine grade is 0.63 and recoveries of 74%. So that is a metric for what is a potentially economic mine here. And we really have the benefit of having uh, all of their actual costs from construction. They built from 2018 through 2021, reached commercial production in 2020. Uh, and that really is an important metric for us. So our target has always been to get to 3 million ounces. And we believe uh, we're on track for that. We believe that the area that uh, you see in this image actually has the potential to host that and, and more. Um, so on this image, uh, lots of colors. Uh, the original resource is orange. All of the holes that are going into the resource are blue and pink. Uh, and all of the green dots are what we're gonna, we've already started to drill this year and we'll complete this year. So another 30,000 meters planned this year, 100 meter step, step out holes, that adds ounces very, very quickly. We're focusing on continued resource growth with three drills turning right now. And on the next slide, you'll see again some of the exploration potential that we have. Here you're seeing a soil anomaly, and I'm not going to belabor it because there's lots, lots of, of exploration potential, and I hope you'll check out the website. But over to the eastern end of our property, which we haven't even ventured into drill, we have an over 10 kilometers squared uh, gold and in soil anomaly um, to follow up on. When we found Powerline, and it was actually a brand new discovery in 2019, um, we originally drilled there because it had been cleared for Victoria Gold substation, and then it wasn't geotechnically suitable. So that's why we drilled there. We now can see on the next slide that this soil anomaly directly corresponds with this resistive siliceous unit, which you can see in this pink that goes over about 16 kilometers east to west across our property. That's given us huge information on where our next targets and, and where to continue drilling. Um, we're using all the information, the structural information, the geochemistry, and the geophysics, and we think it's going to really help us find not only additional ounces, but higher grade. On the next slide, um, you'll see uh, that We've really drilled out power line. The bulk of our, our resource is at power line that you'll see in our update. Holes like 1.73 over 72 meters really add a lot of ounces. And that's why we've got two drills off on the Eastern side of this and one more drill on the West. And the next slide is uh, showing what we've found along that east-west corridor, corridor through about a 500 meter strike uh, through the center going east and west, we're finding some near surface higher grade holes such as the you know, um, 100, 120 meters 
1.28 over 28 meters, 1.53 over 70 meters. Uh, we still have holes pending from last year. We hope that they'll be in before that resource, which will be cut off fairly soon. And on the next slide, um, it really just shows you a few of the highlights from Oryx Hill. This was a little bit further to the east, but again, another area which was pervasively mineralized right from surface and where we think we'll be able to put together an additional near surface resource. The next slide is super important. It's metallurgy or ESG, metallurgy. Yeah, I thought it was metallurgy <laughs> on metallurgy. Can you recover the gold? Um, we did bottle rolls on pulps from both oxide and sulfide and got 90% recoveries, which is very encouraging that this is potentially an open pit, heap leach mineable project. Um, people say, hmm, sulfides, that's odd to get such great recoveries. Well, we can see that the sulfide is actually the host rock. And you can see that in these microscope photographs here that the gold actually intruded in later into the sulfide and is in the fractures. We're continuing to do column leach tests and grain size analysis to understand what the grind size might be um, optimized for, for eventual heat bleaching. And that works ongoing and will continue through the year. On the next slide, you know, we all know what it takes to build a mine and being a next generation explorer means getting the ESG stuff right. Uh, we're doing that uh, very effectively on the environmental side, uh, everything from um, making sure that we're not only exceeding the standards, but communicating well what we're doing, working with the First Nation on our, our baseline environmental. On the social side, I've been working uh, as uh, Steve mentioned in the introduction with a charity in the Yukon long before I became the CEO of Banyan, focused on working with First Nations and schools. Uh, we're really responding to COVID and in our increased efforts for this year. And I encourage you to look up every student every day. And this is all really important for any exploration company. And, and uh, all of the companies today, I think, are, are hitting it off uh, the charts on this. So the next slide, um, we're starting to envision our PA. Uh, we'll have this resource update, and then in the fall, we envision starting our PEA, including some of these new holes now that we found that wide corridor, we're seeing some of that higher grade. We're building our team for this, starting to uh, understand all the components that will need to go into that PA, and we're really benefit from having the actual costs of the not mine that was built right next door over the last few years and their actual operating costs. So that brings me to my next slide, which is, uh, you know, showing you an overview of both of our properties. When I became the CEO, I, we had our Highland Gold project down in Watson Lake, which brings in another almost 500,000 ounces at 0.85. Remarkably, it's in the same belt of rocks, the Highland Group of Meta Sediments. It's also an intrusion related on surface, potentially heat bleach mineable project. We're going to continue to add value at Ormac. Uh, but Highland is another one which really should uh, add value as we move forward as company as well. And then just to bring it on the next slide, we have um, uh, just showing you some of our comparables. You know, we're, we're still pretty undervalued for our current market cap. Uh, just saw some recognition in the market over the last few weeks as we're moving closer to that to that um, resource update. And we know we're gonna have a significant resource update. We should re-rate just purely on number of ounces, but also we're really de-risking this project in a bunch of other areas that are so important to what that dollar value per ounce is uh, from the ESG side, from being in a great jurisdiction with infrastructure to doing that metallurgy and, and PEA work. So look forward to seeing us re-rate as we go through this year, adding value, continuing to add ounces and de-risking this project. So just in summary, on Banyan, lots to look forward to this year with those key catalysts of drill results from last year. On the next slide, um, you'll see uh, we are year round, so we have exploration results throughout the year. We've got results. We've already shipped samples from this year's drill program and we'll continuously ship them through this year. That Q2 resource updates coming fast, followed by our PEA starting in this fall. And I think it's a perfect storm for all the gold companies, uh, including Banyan, what we're seeing out there. Um, there's not a lot of new projects where we're generating multi-million ounce projects in tier one jurisdictions. And it will be, I think we'll have a compelling valuation with our resource update. So thank you very much. Really appreciate everybody staying uh, for this, this whole presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, we do have a quick question here. Um, over the last year, uh, Banyan share prices performed very well. Uh, you know, your share price has more than doubled in the last year. Um, 
what is it that's allowing this, uh, your stock to perform so well, despite many parts of the industry lagging? Well, you know, I think it's a, a lot of those key things that I was talking about. We're a year-round exploration story. We are very aggressively advancing this. That's allowed us, you know, longer drill seasons. People are starting to see the geological potential on the property and the similarities to Victoria Gold. You know, Victoria Gold is continuing to do uh, their deep exploration and, and showing that this is indeed a very large district. And I think that's uh, starting to get recognition and, and we're starting to get out to shows again. I, I was just at BMO in Florida and uh, able to actually talk to investors in person. That's also helping along with uh, the unfortunate geopolitical events, which have, have really got the price of gold starting to move as well. And can you tell, uh, can you tell people where they can learn more about the Every Student Every Day program and maybe where they go to support that? Sure, it's www.everystudenteveryday.ca. Uh, there's a link from our website as well. Um, yeah, we encourage people to, actually today was the day for applications for projects and we're expecting record demand uh, just due to all the impacts of COVID on, on schools and, and First Nations and communities all across the Yukon. Sounds like a great cause. Thank you very much, best of luck and thank you for thank joining you. us today. Thank you guys. Uh, I hope you found the session valuable. Thank you to all our presenters as well. Uh, again, please take a moment to complete the post-event survey on the bottom of the screen. Uh, we appreciate any feedback about the event. Uh, if you're interested in learning more about any of the organizations featured in this session, event materials are available for download. Uh, I'm going to hand it over once more to Jeff for our final wrap up. Thank you for joining me today. Thanks, Steve. What a great uh, series of presentations and kudos to the tech team for calling audibles and handling the technical difficulties. You can't see it, but behind the scenes, there was lots happening uh, and it was very impressive to see. So kudos to them. Um, so the next session in the Faskin uh, mining series will be on the transition from brown to green energy the impact on the South African mining industry taking place on Monday, March 7th, between, beginning at 8 a.m. Eastern time. You can sign up for any of our upcoming webinars, which go on till next Wednesday, at the Faskin Institute section of faskin.com. We hope you can join us then. Thank you to everybody. Have a great weekend.